experience the full power of the dark side. Good! <laughs> we will deal with your rebel friends soon enough. back to Star Wars Beyond the Stars for episode number 25, recorded on Wednesday, March 11th, 2015. I'm your host, Fred, a.k.a. Sith Lord Korv. And joining me tonight is the commander of Sith Intelligence, Agent Louis Alon. Hello, Fred. Hello, YouTube. Hello, Twitch. What is going on? And as always, greetings and time for tea with Imperial Intelligence. There's well, time for tea. We made it through that asteroid field. That's going to collect. Ooh. Told you putting ID-10 T and Treek in the arcade would help. Goopa, noopa. Oh, it explains all my cartel coins, why? Jeez. Damn those two. I know, and I'm the one that gets to empty the machine. Look at all these credits I made. <laughs> yeah, I can't get this credit to go into ID-10 T's vending machine. That's... that's not a coin slot. What? What is this? Put a coin in there. And then the music came down and we all started dancing and regenerating. <laughs> <laughs> so how you doing tonight, Paige? Wonderful. Thrilled to be here. I got a surprise for Lou. Oh, I do love surprises. You're not going to love this one. <laughs> You'll know it when we talk about it. Uh, we're now available on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, and SwiftWarnetwork.com. You can also like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Star Wars Beyond Podcast. You can tweet us at Star Wars Beyond. And our usual record time is Wednesday night, 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time at twitch.tv slash no SHT gaming. And Paige, what's coming up in the Captain's Log tonight? Coming up in the Captain's Log, we have our last week in game. Bioware busts out the belt again, this time on naughty PvPers. Agent Olan's intelligence report where Lou will present Force Powers Part 4, plus the weekly winner of the Agent Star Wars Trivia Question of the Week and your feedback in our community hollow feed. And as always, we do have a couple of things to mention. First off, uh, posted not too long ago on the Bioware forums for SWOTOR, they've announced their latest community cantina. All right, so the SWOTOR community cantina tour in Anaheim, California. And we'll just read off the quick little promo they put here. Quote, we're happy to announce that the next stop in the Star Wars The Old Republic Community Cantina Tour will be happening on Saturday, April 18th in Anaheim for Star Wars Celebration. This is your chance to join the Star Wars The Old Republic community for a development team presentation as well as complimentary drinks, yay, food, and giveaways. Every attendee will also be receiving an Anaheim exclusive Aw, oh, print away congregate vehicle code. We will also have a special appearance by the 500 first. Yes, a green screen area for photos and more. Space is limited, so be sure to come early. 
If you're in the area, make sure to stop by and hang out with us. The venue, the Hilton Anaheim. The date, Saturday, April 18th, 2015. The address, 777, can't go wrong, West Convention Way, Anaheim, California, 92802. Space will be limited, so be sure to arrive early. You can RSVP on Facebook. And see that Facebook RSVP is not required for and does not guarantee admittance. We look forward to seeing you there. Quick, now everybody get excited so that you're even more disappointed when they cancel in a few days. Oh, they can't do that. Anaheim is sunny this time of year. Oh, we're sorry. We had to cancel due to a death in the game. Oh. <laughs> in the game. You know, or, you know, people got sick. <laughs> Could be. But that's cool. They're actually going to be there for Star Celebration, so that should be awesome. Because that means everything, anything Star Wars, folks. Come on, from the movies, the games, anything. That's going to be an awesome Star Wars fest. What is the point of this Facebook RSVP if it's never required and it doesn't guarantee you admittance? Yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe it's their way of saying, oh, whoa, whoa, we don't, don't want that guy in here. <laughs> no, Pull it's, like, <laughs> it's like one of those... Uh, stupid things you get invited to it on facebook you click that you'll be there but it doesn't actually do anything it just gives you like a list of other people that are going to be there so you can connect with them they call or if that anything, farmville well if anything that gives at least it'll give the, the community team an idea a rough idea of actually the numbers they get they need to prepare for you know exactly does help if they're going to the the hell anaheim they can say well we plan at least 150 people RSVP, so let's plan for X amount of people. So we have enough food, drinks, and stuff, you know? <laughs> Gives Tate plenty of time to outline some hiding spots. <laughs> uh, oh. Speaking of which, what's our other quick dimension? And again this morning, uh, Tate Watson released the patch notes for 3.1.1, and there are a lot of them, folks, so what we're going to give you here now are just some really, well, I, I would be lying to quick highlights, but there are some highlights we wanted to mention. Uh, first and foremost, Bounty Contract Week returns. Hunt one of criminals in this returning event. The event begins March 17th, St. Paddy's Day in America. Uh, 4 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time or 11 a.m. Greenwich Mean Time. And ends March 24th at 4 a.m. Pacific Daytime and 11 a.m. Greenwich Mean Time. Right, that's the first thing. So next week, folks, it comes around. Not this week. Or not later on for this you know, this patch. I think it's supposed to come tomorrow. But next week. The following emotes now play in animation when used. Slash duck. I'm hoping that's the, you know, look out. Something's coming as opposed to, you know, I don't want to be a chicken. you into a duck. want to be a chicken. flying and then a little dog pops up and starts trying to shoot you with a gun. Duck I would pay tails. for that. Woo! That would be slash duck hunt. I would actually pay for that. <laughs> uh, slash look. Hmm. Okay. Aren't you always looking unless your eyes are closed? Uh, unless they mean like you're about to actually lean forward and you put your hand over your eyes going, Hey, what's that over there? I, I thought that would be like scout or something. Slash hmm. look. You lean forward and all of your armor clips into your body. I guess we'll just have to wait. See, hopefully Dolphy has a preview of it somewhere. Slash meditate. Hmm. I mean, how many variations of that can we have? I mean, we, well, no. Cause only the knight really gets that, I guess, that quintessential meditate uh, animation when they kneel down to recover. Well, there is a meditate emote where your character, like, closes their eyes and it looks like they're meditating. I, I'm pretty sure that slash command is just going to make your character close their eyes like the emote does, but it'll be temporary and turn itself off after a few seconds. Hmm. Again, we'll wait and see. Slash observe. How's that any different from look? From look, yeah. That okay. <laughs> look, this is just one of this is what they put in the notes, okay? <laughs> in their own patch notes. <laughs> um, slash raise. What are we raising? The roof, uh, glass. Okay. So you type that, and then your subscription fee goes up. <laughs> Don't give them any ideas, man. They um, want to raise. <laughs> slash tap. Free beer for everyone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, for some of us who are legal drinking age, that just that just might pop in the minds. Like, wait a minute, tap. T oh, so was the keg? <laughs> what are we doing? Not accessible to body type one characters since they're clearly underage children. And body type fours are cut off because they've had one too many. Boom. It's not a pizza tap. <laughs> hmm. 
mm. pumping Crisco right into their veins. Oh. Ew. Oh. Yeah, I do, just that mental image. Anyway, and <laughs> following that, conquest points now sort by the number value instead of the first digit in the guild UI. It's very handy. Uh, let's see. Oh, this might help. Wait, wait, wait. Let's get this one last. Oh, okay, okay. The RK-4, RK-5, and RK-6 Star Sports Blasters have all been recalled and now produce a different sound when fired. Oh, so you need to buy them again. I really hope not because I put them on my my power tech, my Merc, my Gunslinger Scoundrel. I'd be really pissed at that. But no, I, I guess, I mean, I, I have them now and I don't have an issue with the sound, so I don't know what's going on. Uh, so I really, I mean, they're fixing it. Okay, I never really noticed an issue with it. But all right, give them that. Um, some class tweaks slash adjustments to all advanced classes. Too many to list, folks. Do yourself a favor. Go to the website or go to Dolphies and check out the detailed breakdown of that. Everyone was touched you know, at least once. And, you know, one of your abilities, if that, was adjusted. Show me on Treak where they touched you. Not about you. All right. Uh, fixes. And adjustments to flashpoints and operations. They fixed, adjusted the following stuff here. Uh, the Ravagers, uh, Temple Sacrifice, Battle of Rishi, Blood Hunt, Depths of Manan, Assault on Tython, Korriban Incursion, and Legacy of the Rakata. Again, uh, there is a detailed breakdown for each of these flashpoints and operations. So go to the website or again hit Dolphies and check out the details of it there. Items and Economy. What they did, let's see, level 60 hard mode flashpoints and story mode operations will now drop Mark 2 gear instead of Mark 1. All right, listening to, to uh, fellow podcasters who do conduct operations and other people on the forums, like, yeah, that, that doesn't make sense when you're doing that level of difficulty and you're getting the previous tiers, uh, you know, stuff. Kind of you know, not conducive to wanting to do that, that sort of uh, operation. Fixed distortion issues on female body types for the Revenite, Deceiver, Pummeler, and bulwark armor sets. Oh, let me let me jump back. We we skip the part here. Just for Fred, they corrected multiple missing stretch textures present on the shaggy hairstyle. No 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 no. This is not just for Fred because <laughs> this is where I wanted to rail on this because the shaggy hair was one of the last ones that were added, and they still didn't fix the ones that came before this. This is some complete garbage right here. And to add yet more salt in the wound, shaggy hair now works on all female body types. Well, that doesn't rub salt in the wound because that's the one you're using, and, you know, at least you got what you paid for now. Yeah, I mean, again, you know, when it finally hits the, the servers and, you know, at least the character I have it on, will it'll actually look decent. So, looking forward to that. And I still have been living up to my commitment of not buying anything out of the cartel market. And they're not making it hard on me either because I looked at the crap that's supposed to be coming to the cartel market and it just gets uglier and uglier. There's nothing that I want coming down the pipe. Oh, save that for later. Save it. Save, save it for later. It, save so, it. Okay. Yeah, uh, they fixed distortion issues. Okay, I just mentioned that. Uh, oh, the following <laughs> crafting items can now be placed on the Galactic Trade Network. Exonium ore. So if you've got it, you can now sell it. And the Matter Transubstantiator can now be sold. They've increased the stats to the appropriate level on the following items. The Yavin Force Healers Mark I Motivator. The Deceiver Force Healers Mark I Motivator. The Masasi Force Healers Mark I Motivator. Yes, apparently from what I've read on the, some of the issues with that gear, it wasn't obviously for a level 60 item or <laughs> for the level of its, it, that it's supposed to be, it just wasn't quite there and it had its issues. So when you got it, it really wasn't helping you. <laughs> so I'm glad they went around and they fixed it for those players that actually have it now. Uh, also, the last thing for items economy that we want to mention, the Veda cloth lower robes no longer cause players' legs to disappear. Now, I've actually seen, you know, I haven't seen any issues with it when you preview it. <laughs> so <laughs> I wonder, you know, I haven't seen anyone in the fleet or anyone where I've been questing or dealing with galleys. I, I haven't seen anyone actually wearing that armor, so I really can't tell how bad this was but man I mean, if they had to fix it to where he actually put it in here it's like ooh so we were there were players running around on the planets with half a body I mean if they <laughs> and it's did, not even Halloween if they did fix it you know it had to be bad 
Because if it was just a clipping thing, they'd be like, oh, that's fine, let it go. It'll be okay. It's all right. The players don't want to see the legs or the boots. That's that's cool. <laughs> and the last thing the uh, well that we're going to mention, uh, mission and NPCs, the missions Forge Alliances Part One, and Forge Alliances Part Two are now available at the same level as the Prelude for Shadow Rabbit. And here's an important note, folks: the progress on these missions have been reset. So if we're in the middle of either of those missions, Part One or Part Two, Forge Alliances, then what's going to happen is that when 3.1.1 hits, if you haven't completed it before then, your progress will be reset. So, word of warning, you may want to get that done. <laughs> You're going to have to go pick up the quest again, or to yes. be back on step one, you need to talk to whoever on the fleet to start yep. it. Yep, you may have to go to the droid, whoever, and, and start all over again, so... But, that could be a sneaky way to do it twice with the, the GSI bot. Do it, oh. don't turn it in, and let them reset it for you. Hmm... Yeah, that could be done. Yeah. Or just, you know, go all the way to the last boss and just leave the instance. Just let it reset. And get and regain all the XP again. Yeah. Hmm. Or, as Play just mentioned, yeah, you know what? Complete it, let it reset, and just do it all over again. I mean, if you do it with the GSI droid, it's not that hard. And it's free XP, free credits, so, hey, not going to complain. They've also fixed an issue that caused players to not receive proper credit from the mission, the enemy within... Upon defeating the Revenant encounter in Temple of Sacrifice, yeah, I, I know that's been a, a ooh, sore point for some players because that very really does suck <laughs> when you do that encounter and like, wait a minute, it didn't count. No, so good. They're they're it's on the way. I love how these next two you're about to read are Republic exclusive problems. Uh, yeah, that, that's uh. a bit worrisome, but at least they're addressing it now. Uh, this next point we're bringing up, Republic players now correctly receive credit when the mission, the weekly one, Galactic Conflicts, when completing hard mode, Battle of Rishi, through the group Finder. Yeah, I've seen on the forums too that some players were extremely stuck on, you know, two out of three for that, so hopefully, you know, good thing, fixes on the way. Next item, troopers who have completed the Flashpoint Depths of Anon now have their involvement acknowledged on the mission Eclipse Squad. Nice, nice little at a boy thing there. And as I mentioned before, this is just a quick summary. As always, please go to the Swartz website or head over to Dolphy.net for all the changes that are coming up for 3.1.1. I wish that I could have run through that as a trooper the way that it was, just to hear them. Like, you actually do the non flashpoint, and then you're talking to the next NPC, and they're like, yeah. We sure could have used Havoc Squad on Manon. <laughs> what are you talking about? I was just there. I just left Manon, man. Yeah, apparently you were too busy doing something else. You couldn't pitch in. <laughs> Look so, at Jorgen. He's still shaking the water out of his fur. Look at him. Selfish <laughs> bastards on Havoc Squad. <laughs> Never help anybody. So, let's go ahead and move into the captain's log. Paige, what have you done over the last week? I'm actually going to be reporting on my last two weeks in game since I wasn't present for last week's recording. You were flying. I was flying. Mostly I played my power tech with Fred Sorcerer. That's my tank and his healer. We decided to queue for the foundry on this duo, and both of us did a very nice job. I kept aggro the entire time we were in there and he kept me and everyone else alive so there you go I did have another bounty hunter in the group that whispered me and told me that he was going to need on all of the tanking gear he was also uh, using some aggro grabbing abilities even though he was not the tank which I can't stand that I think it's ridiculous it did happen to win the items though that dropped but that was really like a crappy thing for him to do to roll against me for that stuff. If you're going to be a tank, you should be in there as a tank and not a DPS. We also finished up Alderaan. I thought we had finished it the week prior, but it turns out we still needed to finish up in the palace, the part where you fight uh, Bors Olgo. And we revived the leveling group this week. And I don't know if anyone's been around long enough to remember that trio that we had. But, see, Fred, you're a... What are you? 
You don't even remember the trio that we you're had. A, you're a Sith warrior. Very good. Which kind? <laughs> the kind with a lightsaber. Uh, juggernaut, yes. I has Jug. Okay. I am an agent. Lou, I believe you're a sorcerer, right? That is correct. Oh, see, I didn't do that bad. You're an operative. I am an Imperial agent. I signed on to this agent, and I realized that I hadn't actually signed on that character since <laughs> <laughs> since the expansion hit. So I was sitting there trying to figure out what the hell spec I was, and I, I knew that Lou was the healer, and, you know, I can't tank, so if I was one of the two DPS, and Fred tells me that I was concealment, and I believed him. And then we queued for flashpoints. I was definitely not concealment <laughs> because I had no idea what any of those abilities were. I'd never played a concealment operative before. And I was so bad at it. I was so bad at it. I'm really going to have to fix that the next time I sign on her. When we were in those flashpoints, I really had no idea what I was doing. I was really just hitting buttons and hoping no one died. Actually, I think I was the only one that died the entire time we did flashpoints. Yes, you died at one time. One time. I don't even know what happened. I was just dead. <laughs> uh, for some, no, I, I, what happens is that for some reason during uh, that one fight, everything just turned to you. <laughs> I think you must have hit, hit a crit and everything just jumped, went from Fred to you. And I was like, oh my god. <laughs> you know what? I, I don't even know. I don't even know if that's what happened because I was just like, "What? what's procking? What does this button do? I don't know. And I'm just pushing and pushing because I can't just jump into a spec like that. I have to study it from the beginning. Next time yeah. I sign her in, I'm going to switch my spec because I obviously wasn't concealment. Probably that damn poison dart that set everyone off. Like, oh, she's got darts. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Luce, what have you been up to over the last week? A little bit of this, a little bit of that. I finally realized again that with the the reset, I guess for for factions, you know, I still have a ton of rep tokens for the Gree Enclave, which I didn't use on on the seven characters I, I I ran through all that week when the event was live. And because of that, I finally made it to uh, halfway to halfway through hero status, you should say, yeah. Halfway through hero. So next time it comes around, three, four, five, six, seven months from now, maybe a year. <laughs> you know, I, I guess I'll be ready if I do the same strategy I did this time around, I'll definitely hit champion. <laughs> you know, I had a thought, Lou. You know how you worked like really hard when the Gree event came around? Mm hmm You know how Bioware like routinely loses achievements for people? Oh, I, I, you know, if that ever happened where it just reset and like, you know what? That's what I was going to say. Like, what if they messed something up horribly and every reputation just reset to zero? Uh, and they're like, well, sad. we don't have the systems to get it back. Okay, I took screenshots for you. I wonder if that would actually work. If you could submit screenshots and be like, I want that back. I if they it. even could give it back. No, yeah, they'd be I, I like, it, it wouldn't be fair to give you back yours when everybody else still lost theirs. Right, but you you know, know, I have proof of mine. Oh, well, you <laughs> could fake your proof. Oh, gosh. If, you know, if we use that argument, it's like you can't win. Because they could always go back to that tech threat. Well, we can't prove it that you didn't Photoshop this or anything. Like, okay, whatever. Yeah. Then they tell us they don't have the tech to give back the achievements, and then like a month later, something would get wiped out, and they'd look it up exactly and give it back to somebody. <laughs> well, yeah, that that's for a later discussion. <laughs> we'll, we'll put that in for later. This is foreshadowing. Yeah. Let's see. Oh, uh, my operative. I've got her crew almost complete with the uh, free 192 level uh, companion armor that Yav and Ford gives you when you do the weekly mission Spirit of Cooperation. Uh, as of today, I finally finished off with uh, with Dr. Logan. All the other companions all have... Uh, they have both sets of gear. So, for example, if, if HK-51 could have two sets of gear, I got them both. So one week I would get him you know, the assault gear. Next week I get him the other gear. So now I finally, when I mean finished up, and now Loken is, he's got one set and I have to work on the other one now. The only downside, I mean, I'm, I'm glad they got it. 
I mean, I'm glad they act that Fiverr put this in the game. Okay, where it gives you a chance to, you know, where you don't have to waste your credits or your comms if you don't want to. I mean, if you're, if you're I mean, if you're stretched for time or whatever because of how your game or whatever happens, at least you have an opportunity. Hey, you know what? You run the eight missions on Yavin 4. Okay? You get that one weekly and boom. You know, companion of your choice gets free 192 gear and makes them viable. You know, for end game, you know, PvE content. Custom content, which is cool. You know, the only problem I have with it though is like it's there, but now it kind of makes all your companions look generic. I mean, they all have the same look now. And even though I'm not a role player, I mean, I do you know, take pride in making my companions get that one look I have uh, that I want for that companion on all my characters. You know, if I want to make Zalek look like a badass, you know, I'll do that. Same thing with, you know, with Pierce. Uh, the conspiracy theorist in me has an idea of what they're going to do down the road. I mean, you, but, know, you know, oh. uh, well, like they're giving you this companion gear now and it's this purple gear that you can't mod or anything, but it's way better than what you could normally get for a companion. Mm-hmm. I think eventually they're going to start selling those companion gear sets and be like, it's not pay to win because you can get a version of it in the game, but these ones look cooler. Well, you know what? At that point, it, it, I think it all boils down to if it's purely a cosmetic look, I wouldn't have an issue with it. But if it was where they bumped up the stats and the bonuses you know, that the companions get on that gear, then I would have an issue with it. Well, see, I would have an issue with it either way because we have a system in place already for cosmetic purposes. That companion gear should be oranges with removable mods that are companion only. True, and, and which is a point that I, I, I believe, if I, if I recall correctly, a few players did mention in the forum saying, you know, what was a harm and, you know, you could have made it moddable, orange moddable gear like we have access to, and they have access to if we want to dump that, that gear on our companions. And there's also a way to where you can restricted to where, yeah, you know what, the players can't use it for themselves. I mean, it's possible. I mean, we see it in, on, on other pieces of gear in the game. You know, players can't put it somewhere else. You know, if you want the full benefits, it has to stay here in a certain arrangement. Again, speaking of the fact that I'm not a programmer, I don't know how difficult it would be, but I'm sure that they would put, they could put something like that in place to where, hey, yes, it's moddable, you can rip out the mods, but only the companions can use it. Just like when you see the gear, so, you know, only Mako, blah, 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 none of these characters can use it. You know, if they could put that restriction on the box itself and that gear, heck, go a little, you know, one more step, just slap it on the mods that come in that gear for them. So Should, Shouldn't be any harder than when they put set bonuses on armoring pieces. Right. Right, or, you know, when, you know, free-to-play players can't use artifact-level gear, you know, that's coded to, well, no, you're free-to-play, you know, or preferred and you didn't pay for the unlock. No, you can't use artifact-level gear. Same restriction. So, you know, the means are there, and they just have to do it. Um, my Sentinel Marauder will actually finish off their companions within the next couple of weeks or so. So I'm happy about that. I've also been running Dale as my Shadow to build up her credits. Because she was one of my poorest characters when Shadow of Reven released. So, eventually they need to augment and supplement her gear. You know, it is important. Especially getting her accuracy since she's mule DPS, you know, I really have to go over that 100% accuracy mark. And because of that, uh, I'm also investing in companion gifts to help max out affection, or at least be able to finish all the conversations with the 10 companions that give the Legacy Wide Accuracy bonus. Uh, for example, you know, Kem Val, Skaj, Brumark, Scorpio, Scourge, Kaizen, Tano, and Bodar. Right, right now I've only maxed out a with Scorpio and uh, Kem Val. You know, my Shadow, I never really play with Kaizen Fest at all. Tano, Vic, Bodar, they always stay in the ship. Same with Broomark and Scourge. So it's just going to be a whole lot of spending credits and just doing the old, is it on cool, off cool now? Right click, right click, right click. <laughs> yeah, been there. Yep, and you know, obviously with each companion, it's 1%. So the more you do it, a... Hey, as someone pointed out, you know, it's like a free, sort of free way of getting the accuracy bonus without investing heavily in the gear. It's like just buy the gifts, or if you play with these companions naturally, just raise their affection, max it out, get there, and hey, boom, you get the extra 1%. Tacked on to your characters, which is nice. All Also, I hit my power tech hit 60 a couple of days ago, and this is even before I finished Rishi and continuing the story on Yavin 4. I mean, I actually, I think I was in the middle of one of the, uh, gosh. One of the missions for uh, Aaron Cow, all right, that Rishi, quote unquote, chieftain that's there 
on that second island on Rishi, and I hit 60. I was like, oh, okay, it's cool. Usually it's always been, I always hit 60 in the middle of Yavin. Like, half through the story on Yavin, I, that's when I hit 60 in my characters. Hmm. So, I don't know. Did you do anything with the power tech during Double XP weekend? Yes and no. I mean, I did a little bit on her, but then on the last Double XP weekend we had, I was actually focusing on my lower level alts, like the ones in their teens and 20s. Those are the ones I focused on. The ones that needed to get off Balmora? Yeah, the ones that needed to get the hell off Balmora. <laughs> Especially those characters. Something tells me you don't like Balmora. Oh, I, I, you know, I wish that planet eventually joined Alderaan. Just, just get ID <laughs> totally <Tenti>. blown away. <laughs> ID Tenti now? set a course for Alderaan. So, Lou, would you have been more upset if Episode 7 was based on Balmora instead of Tattoo? No, because then I would be more forgiving. Say, all right, you know what? It's several thousand years in the future. None of this crap's going on. <laughs> and then you get they get there and like the exact same quest givers from the old republic are there. No, or you know what? <laughs> what the hell? They're landing in Sobrick? What is this? Oh wait, I know that. That's the <clears throat> droid factory, isn't it? Look at that. Yeah, like they don't call them like by the same names they have in the old republic, but you actually see the actors walk out of the spaceport and everybody's just arranged the exact same way that they are in the game. It's the same layout, almost the same construction. Like, wait, this is Sobrick. What is this? Uh, you go up to that one guy and he's like, hey, I need you to clean up some alien crime in the back of a cantina. Yeah. Or that one guy out to the left, just down the stairs, saying, hey, I know, I know things. I'm pretty high up in the resistance. I can tell things. Like, oh, you snitch. And that guy is Han Solo. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> but let's see. I mean, just to finish up my my power tech. Uh, at that point, when I leveled, I got hit sixty. I actually had enough comms on it to actually buy the initial pieces of the base comm gear that you get there. And yeah, you know, it just felt a little off, saying, "Wow, I'm actually not even done with the story, and I'm already in the gear I can get." Okay, that's cool. <laughs> not too bad. Not too shabby. And since I already my power tech had maxed out effects from Mako a long time ago, and since I bought Treek a couple weeks ago, uh, Mako has been relegated to ship duty with two VR8. And obviously, since you know, uh, on my power tech, one of the very first weeklies I did on her <laughs> was let me get Treek's gear, let me get her healer gear. And gosh, all things being said, because Mako has her 192 gear as well, and man, Treek is a hell of a lot better than she is keeping me alive on my PT. Funny story, when I leveled up my Guardian on Shadowlands, I never upgraded Tree's gear until I got to max level, and she healed me just fine all the way. Yeah, which, you know, which boggles my mind. Because again, with all with gear being equal, split between both companions, and again, you know, one just, you know, you just can't, can't, she just performs better. And as we mentioned before in the past, as, as people in our chat room mentioned before, you know, she, she just has the better AI. You hear that, Tree? You're good for something. I forget where I heard it, but there was, at some point, someone from Bioware was asked about Treek and why she was so superior to other companions. And the answer that they gave was basically they wanted her to be versatile and usable by any class, but they even admitted that they went overboard with her, and she's way better than she should be. Yeah, and at this point, though, if they ever made adjustments to her, I think the outcry... Oh my gosh, could you imagine? We paid for that. Right, and, and you know, I, I think it would be a lose-lose situation for them, if, for Bioware, if they did do that. Because then the argument could be said, too, you know what, instead of nerfing Treek, just buff everyone else up to her level. Well, that's the only way to win at this point, I think. Yeah, at this point, I, I wish they would do that. You know, make, you know, I, look, the only reason why I'm so down on Treek is the fact that she is just so much better than the companions, you know, I've used the past three years that I've grown attached to because of the storyline. You know, you know, I, I choose and pick the companions I want to use because I like how they complement my version or, you know, my story for my Sentinel, for my Marauder, for my Shadow. And then just say, you know what, you get relegated to this because, you know, for X amount of cartel coins, that contract, damn, I got a better healer. Damn, I got a better tank. And damn, I got a better DPS companion. Well, you know, there seems to be a hierarchy even with the normal companions of who's better than who. Because, you know, on an Inquisitor, for instance... Kem Vol is a beast as a tank. And then if you get on a Jedi and you're trying to play with Lord Scourge as your tank, he's, like, made of paper. He gets the crap beat out of him, even when he's in good gear. That, yeah, I think that if you commit, 
compare. <laughs> if you compare Mako and Quinn, I find Quinn to be a better healer than Mako. Bite your tongue. I will not. I find 2VR8 to be a better healer than Quinn. <laughs> <laughs> You're just a hater. Quinn, well, 2VR8 can use a blaster now. Yeah, we announced that on the show a couple weeks ago. I know, but you're missing the important thing. They made a change to the game and it worked. <laughs> it's, you know, again, it's played, said in the chat. Yeah, they need to move her AI to other companions. You know, if they if they did that, I think a lot of players... <laughs> heck, yeah, I think a lot of players would be very happy with that. Because they see a definite change in performance, an upgrade in performance of other companions. I have no doubt they're going to add her AI to another companion, but it's going to be another companion you buy. Hopefully a cell cat. <laughs> Look, just get the cell calf droid customization for HK-51, and there you go. That's as close to Manon as you can get. Other than just hanging out in Manon all the time. <laughs> now, what if they add a cell calf companion that has Creek's AI? That'd be cool. Like, hey, look, look, guys, I have my own, my own walking catfish. You know, if they actually add that, I might have to, I might have to go against my word of not buying anything until they fix those hairstyles. <laughs> well, it's not a hairstyle. Well, I know, but I said I wasn't going to buy. <laughs> anything until they fix those hairstyles that I bought. Mm. Oh well. But if I see a cell cap companion come in, all bets might be off. Well, I'd have to see him in the game first to make sure that he's not broken. <laughs> like you buy the cell cap and it's uh, invisible. See, but you can't trust the preview window either because look what happens for uh, for Robe Armor when you preview mounts in the game. <laughs> oh no, I'm no fool. If they had a new companion, I'm going to see other players with it first. Dolphy, you better have the preview for this up quick, please. Let us see it in action. You're our only hope. And I just hope he makes that bubble noise the whole time. That's part of their speech, man. <laughs> oh, no, I just talk. want him to talk as much as Tree, but make that noise when he talks. Brad, you just sounded like a Goron from Legend of Zelda. <laughs> That was more Murlocky. I was gonna say. I was <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say. You know what? My my lock is firing up her. Uh, sorry, <laughs> kill all Murlocks. All right, so that wraps up my my past week in game. What about you, Fred? What have you been up to? Okay. Well, as Paige mentioned, I played my sorcerer with her power tech, and we completely finished Alderaan. And I really thought we were done with that stupid planet last time, but apparently we missed one little quest where we had to go defeat Boris Olgo, and then. The Sith delegation was basically like, oh, okay, we're, we have no more use of you. You can leave now. Do your own thing. So then we went on a little scavenger hunt. Oh, I forgot about this. <laughs> because I liked the armor that I had, but it was kind of like mismatched. I wanted to get the stuff that matched my chest armor that was orange and came from the different heroics. So we went around and we did these heroic twos and fours because we were like 20 levels over them on Tatooine. And well, like ten levels, and we were blowing through these heroics. And Torhead let me down, Lou, because Torhead listed a lot of these items as being oranges, and when I got them, they were blues. Ooh, yeesh. yeah, that really upset me. And it listed them with the wrong quests, but I found a guide from Dolphy on the official forums where she posted what the actual reward is for each quest. So I was able to find all of the orange pieces to the set, but it upsets me that the boots, waist, and wrists, for some reason, are blues and not oranges. Yeah, they do that a lot with the armor sets, especially during the leveling process to where you'll have some really cool looking armor, but then they just won't finish the sets. Like, all you have to do are, is the, it's like, what is the eternal, one of the cries? The belt and the braces are nowhere to be found, or they're not orange modelable. <laughs> Yeah, but this time the boots, too. Like, why are the boots not orange? I feel like bracers and waist are, like, the hardest to get an orange slot in when you're leveling up. Mm-hmm. Well, and it seems like <laughs> it should give you some more opportunities to get those. Pre-market, they were really hard. But, I mean, now it's to the point where you can go on the GTN and get an adaptable belt and wrist for not even 10K. Because they're just garbage. People get them from these sets. They're like, oh, here's this ugly waist thing. You want this twisted off garbage bag to wrap around your waist? Yeah, here. 2K. 
<laughs> that wrists. Okay, well here here's a sweaty armband that a Jawa got shot in. That would be one k. You know that's not. <laughs> well, I mean that's basically it. Like they take the ugliest stuff that nobody wants to buy, and they sell it for the cheapest thing available because you can't vendor that stuff. Cartel market stuff has no value to a vendor. They're just like, take this crap from me. It's basically like them trying to sell grays to the public. <laughs> Here, take this. Two credits, just take it from me. <laughs> and, and I've actually seen people on the fleet before with stuff like that where they're like, this stuff's free if anybody wants to take it. All right, so then I got on my juggernaut with the leveling group, which we haven't played this group since pre-12 times XP. Which was well before 3.0 launched. That was back in the fall, wasn't it? <laughs> yes, and the reason why we stopped that was because we all pre-ordered at different times, and some of us had 12 times XP, some of us didn't, and the group just would not have stayed together. So we're like, okay, we need to shelf this group for a little bit, and we'll come back to it later. So we picked it up last night, and we decided we're going to do flashpoints, which seems like a great idea. But for some reason... And I can't figure this out. I think some adjustments need to be made on the Bioware end of the group finder. Because we're, we were pretty close to the same level. Like within one level of each other. Mm -hmm. And for some reason the group finder queued us into a flashpoint where everything was gray. There was no XP being awarded. Just credits and crappy loot that none of us could even really use. Yeah, I, I think it was due to the fact that one group we did run we were paired with that uh that juggernaut who came in as dps and remember he was level 30 he was yeah he was 15 levels above us yeah but that was kdy that was was it KDY? i thought it was uh no when we got that guy that was that far ahead of us that was yeah. tactical the because basically what we did was we had two flashpoints available at level athos and hammer station and then we had the tactical daily reward and we wanted to run each thing we could do one time so we did three flash points back to back we did Aethys first because that's what popped up on the group finder and we wanted to get the random reward and then we did hammer station because that was the other option for our level range little did we know when we got in there everything in hammer station was gray so we got no XP for doing this but we couldn't just stop in the middle of it because there was somebody else in our group and we didn't want to be total douchebags and just dump them so we went through this whole flashpoint and basically earned almost nothing for doing that except the xp you get at the very end of it and then we went to co drive yards and breezed through that that had to have been the fastest co run i've done in a long time because you know three out of the four people there knew what they were doing <laughs> <laughs> now now let's, let's <laughs> that fourth guy I mean come on <laughs> yeah we won't, we won't talk smack about Bob <laughs> he's no, doing his best his name was Mr. Something we kept saying it Mr. J. Connell Bob <laughs> uh, no <laughs> it was Mr. oh Noopa Noopa Yes. Yeah. yeah. I don't know what he... I mean, he, he was definitely DPS spec, and he was running it. I mean, I know it's a tactical, and you really don't need any formal setup, but I was there, and I was tank spec, and perfectly outfitted to tank in a tactical, and this dude was just running ahead of all of us, pulling everything, and getting <laughs> beat down. But, you know, it ended up working out. We did it in the end. All right, so then... The other thing that I did was I checked out the PTS because they put the new patch on there and I figured I'm going to get on here I'm going to see if they actually fix the shaggy hair to look normal. Well that's when I got on the cartel market and I realized you can't test that kind of stuff on, on the PTS because for some reason the PTS still has like the initial version of the cartel market like before anything was ever added to it. Like, you oh, log in there, there's not even enough stuff in the PTS cartel market to, like, line the front page. <laughs> okay. Like, it, it's pretty terrible. So there was no way for me to actually see that hair to see if it was fixed and working. 
And the last thing that I've done over the last week is I've been trying to work on my cyber tech on Shadowlands because I have a max level one on Jedi Covenant. And I like being able to make my own mods and armorings for my gear as I go. And for some reason, it is a complete drag trying to level up Cybertech this time around. I'm just sitting in my stronghold, keeping my companions busy, because I got six of them I can have crafting at a time. And for some reason, it seems like no matter how much time I invest, it's just a slog. Like, I can only make the level 29 gear right now. And my characters are pushing into the 30s, so it's like I need to do more with Cybertech before I worry about advancing more, or otherwise I'm going to have to find other ways to gear up. Mm -hmm. So that's the hurdle I've been trying to clear. You know, short and sweet. And so, then I think it's time we move into our discussion topic, where Bioware takes action against wind traders and griefers in ranked PvP. Aw, oh, snap. Pick your own switch. Paige, why don't you read this post from Eric Musco? Update on wind trading and griefing in Season 4. This was posted on March 10th at 12.45 p.m. Hey, folks. As promised, we want to keep you informed on what we are doing about these wind traders and trolls in ranked PvP. Here is what's happening right now. Wind traders... We have been reviewing multiple sets of data, along with private reports that many of you have been sending to the team. Any player who, through validating data, is when trading is, re is receiving will be receiving, at a minimum, a warning. Not only are we warning these users to stop what they are doing, continued win trading will lead to greater actions, including resetting their ratings and suspension time. Griefer. Those players that seem to have that one singular purpose, to ruin the spirit of ranked PvP. They refuse to participate or they leave the match altogether. Those players will be receiving anything from a warning to suspension time based on the severity of their actions. We will work to refine our data and our validation around players partaking in these actions throughout the season. Those who feel the need to try to trade their way to the top or try to ruin the experience for others will be actioned appropriately. Thank you all for your continued reports around these issues. Get in there and fight each other as Baron Deathmark intended. See you in the arena, Eric. Okay, so we've seen several posts after this. This has actually been one of the trending posts in the dev tracker lately. Eric keeps answering follow-up questions, but the long and the short of it is that Bioware is analyzing data and reports, and then they're warning or suspending people for up to one week. He actually said one week is the max. And so, I'm going to throw this to you first, Lou. How do you feel about Bioware actually starting to take action and punish people in this game? Because this is only the second public example that we've seen of something like this happen. Well, for one, I'm glad that they're finally deciding to take action of any kind against players who, for some reason, feel the need to exploit the game through whatever means or ruin other players' experiences just because they can. You know, uh, for ranked PvP, you know, I don't PvP in the game, but I know when doing other competitive things like, well, real life in sports or in other modes that I play, you know, where you're going for that uh, progression, you're going for that hardcore uh, mindset. You want those goals, and you get that one or two people in these in these areas who just they're just there to ruin your time because you know what they that's that's what makes them jolly. Okay, nothing else in the game makes them happy but to ruin other players' experiences. And you know, players like that, you know, that's what. So, at least for me, I, I think it's. That type of play style and those kinds of players that give MMOs uh, sort of a, a, a bad, uh, you know, bad feeling to other players in the gaming community who don't play MMOs normally. You know, those who play single player RPGs. Okay, I mean, I'll use an example. Recently came out just last year. What what do we have? Elder Scrolls Online. Okay. A lot of the fan base there that was potentially drawn to that 
you know, the Elder Scrolls fans. And, you know, for those who play it, the Elder Scrolls series is a single-player RPG game. But what's happening is the fact that, you know, Zoss took it, made it to an MMO, you know, took that franchise, took that uh, IP, made an MMO, and now you have all these players voicing their concerns because, hey, you know what? These are, single, you know, these are players coming from the SPG, SPRBG mindset. All right, they're just there to have fun, have a good time. But they know and they've heard stories about players who just go out there just to be D-bagged because they can't. You know, whether it's a high level or they can... There are ways for players to ruin the experience for everyone else. And, you know, that's one thing that I think that I'm glad that Bioware is addressing, the fact that, you know what, they've seen it. It's been there. Okay, not, not going to get into the fact that it's been there for a while, okay? I mean, heck, going that's what on. I did last season. You know, it, it's, it's been going on. See my okay. crystal? Yeah, I mean, I'm not... I'm I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. It's been happening for a while in this game. I mean, last season they designed the system to encourage it. They wanted people. They just wanted people to queue, and people like me that weren't even hardcore PVPers were queuing up for ranked PVP. And I mean, I wasn't amongst like the worst of the worst because I'd actually get in there and I would participate and try to win. But like, there were other people that would just queue up and they just you know, walk around, stand there, or whatever, because they just needed the credit to get rewards. Now, at least this season, they were smart enough to go, okay, you're not just going to get rewards for participating this time. Like, this time, you actually have to get a minimum rank. <laughs> but last season, it was totally catering to people griefing to get prizes. Right, but at least now we're, we're seeing progress, Okay. Again, granted, you know these issues aren't new. It's been happening for a while, but at least now Bioware has, is taking the steps necessary to put a, you know to clamp it, clamp down on it, and to you know help make it go away. All right, will it go away entirely? No, because nothing no system is perfect. But at least they're they're taking these steps, and they you know with Eric Musco putting this on the forums. At least now you have an official statement from the team and from the dev saying, "Look, we know it's there." And this is what we're going to do. Okay, this is what we're going. This is what we want to achieve. You know, to help make the player experience that much better. Because I, again, the, the biggest problem they have to do is perception. You know, like people perceive that ranked PvP or any type of PvP is is bork because you know we know there's win trading going on, or we know that players are ruining the ranked PvP queues because they're just there to jerk around and just you know be a hats about it, and so they don't do it. So what happens? You know, those queues take a long time to pop because no one wants to do it. Because the perception is that hey, those that part of the game is borked. I'm not going to do it. I may want to, but because of uh, of these past issues that people heard about, or they, you know, again, rumor mill, what have you, personal experience, they don't want to do it anymore. I just hope that this isn't going to be their new tactic. Where anytime anything happens in the game, they're going to go go make a big spectacle of it on the forums and go oh, oh well we're doing data and people are going to get suspended and banned because sooner or later that tactic isn't going to work anymore because I mean I hope that they actually have these numbers and they're nailing the majority of people and it's not they're just going to find a handful doing their doing like this little casual search punish a handful of people and just keep talking big on the forums to try to intimidate other people away from doing these exploits and griefing and you know what I mean like instead of them actually being super effective with the punishment they're trying to make it seem like they're better at it than they actually are right exactly they're putting up a smoke screen to actually cover the fact that they're that they're ineffectual yes so the I guess the point Fred's trying to make is they really need to back this up now it's out there they said this is what we're doing the team has said this is what we're this is what we're doing these are our steps this is our general plan okay now that you said it the only way to make it stick, the only way for your players to believe you is to actually come through and do it. I mean, if you're going to say, yeah, we have the data. Look, they have multiple sets of data. All they have to do now is sift through it, identify the players who are doing it, again, recheck it and re-verify, and then, you know, slam the hammer, you know, put the hammer on them. I, I see this often that permitting is promoting and with them taking action against people who are purposefully trying to just ruin other people's gameplay I think is a good thing but they have to be consistent with this 
they can't just pick and choose who they're going to nail because if you get someone that gets suspended for um, like trade winning they're just going to go troll something else or if you get someone that's just trolling in the ranked PvP and you say you give them a warning they're just going to go do it somewhere else because that's what they like to do if you actually back up your threat of suspension with the suspension and possibly even going as far as saying all right three strikes you're out or whatever that really discourages people from misbehaving and i think if you want to troll people there's a better way to do it and that is to kick their butt in pvp the right way to be actually good at what you're doing because when you're when you're the person who comes in there and you kick the shaduki out of everybody they hate you they actually hate you. But if you go in there and you walk around and don't actually participate or, you know, you do whatever you do, disappear, or leave the group. No one hates you. They just think you're an idiot. You want to be hated? You have to be really good at what you do. I don't know, because if I was in a ranked match and I was taking that seriously and somebody joined my team that like they weren't in PvP gear and they're just walking around doing nothing. I would be kind of pissed that they're making my rating go down because they're not even able to compete at that level. Yeah, you'd be mad and you'd think that that person is an idiot. Be like, you know, what is this loser doing? This guy isn't even helping, blah, blah, blah. But if you get a dude that's in there slaughtering you, you're really going to hate that guy. Yeah, that is true. Mm-hmm. You know, as Play pointed out in, in the chat, you know, let strikes in different areas stack into suspension, which is a good point because other MMOs I've played in the past have done that to where if you act like a D-bag in one part of the game, okay, you know what? That leads you to getting banned for a while. You know, you get suspended. You know, yes, let area, if they want, let different, different strikes in areas stack up to suspension or – for some games where they don't tolerate that kind of crap from day one, they just say, you know what? If you act like a jerk, we don't care. We'll ban you for a week, two, three weeks, a month. And oh, by the way, you can't post in the forums. And yeah, you know what? If you really think you were, it was unfair, talk to customer service, put in the ticket, deal with our CSMs there. Don't bother going to the game because you're, you're not getting in. See, Musco made a post in response to one person where he basically said when people are getting reported – that's giving them people that they look at to try to figure out what they need to look for in other people to decide who's win trading and stuff. So that makes me think that this is going to be like the Ravagers thing where they're going to track down a handful of people that they're confident actually did this because, you know, with win trading, it can be sketchy. And if they're not 100%, they're not going to act against people. So their goal is we're going to hit this small target group of people and we're going to make a big spectacle of it on the forums and be like, okay, yeah, people are getting suspended now for win trading. And then they, if, you, if you're one of the people doing that, they want you to look at the forums and go, oh, man, people are getting busted for this. They didn't get me yet, but I should stop before they do. See, that's kind of the point that I was trying to make. First of all, not everyone just sits around reading the forums all the time. I know I don't frequently go there because I just have no desire to. I get my news the way I like to get it, and it's not from there. You get people that don't go there. And then what I was trying to say is when they're applying this disciplinary action to these offenses, I believe that similar offenses should get the same type of disciplinary action because even if even if I decided that I wasn't going to troll and rank PvP anymore, which I don't, but I'm using myself as an example, if I decided, oh, well, they said that they're going to start suspending people, I better not do that. Like, well, you know what? They didn't say anything about trolling people in Flashpoint, so why don't I just do that? If people think they can get away with something, they're going to do it. Well, I think the difference is, like, when it comes to Flashpoints, if you were to go into a Flashpoint group and you're trolling or whatever, those people could just boot kick you and get somebody else in there. Whereas with ranked PvP and PvP in general... You can't kick anybody out of a PvP group. That was just an example, Fred. Well, it's a whole different level of trolling. Like, these people, when they're going in and trolling these people in ranked PvP, 
they're actually ruining somebody's experience and taking away possible rewards from them that they may never be able to get again. And that's what these people are enjoying, just completely pissing on somebody's parade. It's the same offense, but with a different consequence. People are, you know, trolling or whatever in one area of the game, doing the same thing in another area of the game, but maybe someone isn't suffering as much. That doesn't mean that the offense is any less, you know, punishable. Right. In, at the end of the day, it's, it's going to be uh, bad player behavior. You know, there's got to be no, no gray lines. It's, you know, this is ex- this is unacceptable behavior. You know, and it's got to have the same same consequences across the board. Otherwise, they're going to mire themselves into so much crap. <laughs> you know, it'll be easier to say, look, this type of player behavior is unacceptable to us. You know, spit it out and leave themselves gray. Are saying, but we reserve the final right, as always, to make that determination. So when players ask, well, we, I want to see black and white. Well, you know what? You sign the yield and toss, guess what? We said there's a gray area, and we get to determine that. So feel it's unfair, right an appeal. And yeah, you know what? That may hurt some legitimate players. Okay, it's going to happen. It will. And that's an unfortunate part of it. But if you really want to see punishment start coming down, you know, they've got to start somewhere. And again, you know, Eric Musco put this out there saying this is this is what we're doing. This is our plan. And as we mentioned before we went live, you know, now they put it out there. Okay, now you now we get to see whether or not they put teeth into this because you can bark all you want, but if you're not going to bite down, clamp down, and really punish those players who are you know, ruining other players' experience just for the sheer hell of it, come on, this is just smoke. It's just smoke. It's just a smoke screen. Well. You know, as somebody that's followed this game since it launched, at least, I've noticed certain trends with Bioware. And up until the Ravagers thing, they've always been this company where my personal perception is that they like to blow hot air a lot. Because you would always get a generic response like, oh, we know this is going on and people will be dealt with accordingly. But for privacy issues, we can't tell you what we're doing to these people and all this stuff. You know, oh, bull lucky. They, yeah, they just throw that out there. But th- then as soon as the Ravagers thing happens, well, since everybody knows what's going on, we're going to tell you what we're doing to people. And, I mean, I will admit that's the first time I've ever seen a game company come forward and say, this is what we're doing to the people we catch. Like, this is the punishment. But that also makes me think that because of what I've seen from Bioware, like with the achievements thing, we don't have the technology to tell who lost achievements and stuff. I don't think that they have the technology to do these kind of punishments that they're threatening to do. And I think that's why after the punishment went out for the Ravagers thing, you see people on the forums going, yep, I exploited that 25 times, got suspended for one day. And yet the more egregious offenders are supposed to get punished harder. I mean, it just doesn't seem like they can follow through with what they claim to be doing and I know they're going to catch some people that are win trading probably the ones that are completely stupid and they're there on the fleet just auctioning for people to win trade with them those are probably going to be the people that get caught the ones that actually put into text that they are win trading because they're probably going to search all the chat logs for any reference of win trade that would be my guess. But they're going to find this small group of people. They're going to punish them up to a week's suspension. And then he's going to go on the forums and make it sound like this big elaborate thing. Yeah, we, we weeded out probably 80% of the win traders and we punished them all. And then all the ones that didn't get caught are supposed to read that and go, man, they're really starting to crack down on these people. I should probably quit what I'm doing right now. But it's not going to happen like that. Nobody's going to stop until they get caught. And they're not going to get caught until Bioware gets better tools. You're right. Yeah, they. You know, it does seem that there's a uh, lack of technology in their part to where they don't have the tools built into the game right now to perhaps accurately search that data or be even able to collect it at this point. Because remember, Bioware has admitted in the past that they don't have the the technology to do certain things to collate certain amounts of data. You know, for example. 
when the legacy system, legacy system went live, what happened to the achievements then? You know, you know, players who had done this, this, and this past, even though it was, you know, it was tagged to their character, what did Bioware tell those players? You have to do it all over again because we can't track that. Our system, you know, isn't smart enough to actually say, "Oh, wait, the player did that already." Give them the achievement, right? And you know, players is a good point too. Yeah, at this point, like I said, Bioware is now taking the steps to do something about it. And this may be the first step they take. That they're actually now building a template that they can use from now on. Saying, "All right, this is the template we're going to use." Obviously, it'll adjust. It'll change as time grows goes on. But they have to start somewhere. And as they start sifting through all these reports, all this data, maybe they'll refine it to something that's even better, more efficient, and hopefully, you know, actually fair. Because again, you know, we don't want to punish legitimate players because that will happen. You know, you will see legitimate players. They will get banned. They will get punished in different games, and they have to appeal that. But you know, you don't want to put a player through that because that can be a negative experience. Whatever, it may sour them from that point forward. But again, Bioware is starting. They put it out there. Must go public. Put it out there saying this is what Bioware is committed to doing right now, to help players who enjoy the PvP aspect of the game. We want to make their experience meaningful. We want them to have fun. You know, and when that you know, again when groups of players are enjoying the hell of an aspect of the game, what happens? They talk about it. They'll talk about it with their friends, their guild. They'll BS about it in zone chat, general chat. And you know what happens? People say, hey, you know what? That sounds pretty cool. Let me check it out. You know, And in the end, I think that you know, that's what I hope is going to happen with this. Because if Bioware does follow through, they do clean up their act. They do start policing not only ranked PvP, but other aspects of the game where where trolls and griefers exist, you know, you're going to have a much better player climate, much better environment, friendly environment, to where new players won't be intimidated, or even just even put off when they hear about, oh, this is the kind of activity that happens in these parts of the game. Guess what? You may you just lost a potential customer because, again, what do they perceive? They perceive this because they've heard or read from different sites. This is what happens in the game. You know, you know, case in point. Again, in the chat, you know, Eve Online. That completely scares a lot of people away because there is a <laughs> it's a free for all, and not a lot of players are used to that. To where there is very little to no control from the devs on purpose to control the player base. Yeah, I mean it's basically what you just said. It works both ways. If people are playing something and they enjoy it, they'll they'll talk to people about it. They'll spread the good news. You know, hey. The, this ranked PvP and Smoke Tour was really fun. Maybe you should come try it. But if it completely sucks, they'll tell people that too. Oh man, ranked PvP and Smoke Tour is so horrible. Right. I, but again, you know, here's an opportunity for them to actually police up that part of the game, make it fun, make it more viable for everyone, make it, you know, make it openly, you know, invite people to actually participate in it. Well, you know, who cares if you're a two, three, four year veteran? Hey, you know what? You can be a brand new player. You know what? Season five started. Heck, I'll try it. You know? I'm glad that they're making an effort to start with the discipline now, but I do hope that it's real discipline that's occurring, and it's not a front to try to scare people away from doing the bad things. And I certainly do hope that if they're catching repeat offenders, like if they're finding people that are doing this griefing in ranked PvP, are some of the same people that exploited the Ravagers. I hope this discipline is getting progressive and getting worse for these people. Because somebody that has 15 infractions on their account shouldn't be getting the same discipline level as somebody that this is their first offense. I agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, again, repeat offenders, you know what? It shouldn't even go to three strikes, you're out. It's like, man, you have a history. (laughs) Goodbye. (laughs) Because in in, in the end, we we all sign the EULA in the terms of service. You know, Bioware doesn't need to give us a reason whatsoever if they want to cancel our account. They can make it whatever reason they want to in the end. Because say, your name is stupid. Well, I wouldn't go that far, but in the end, they can do whatever they want to the game. Hey, any reason they want. Your name's stupid. You're out. Right. Because, <laughs> again, what did we do? We digitally signed. We agreed to those terms of service. We agreed to the end user license agreement. Okay. We paid to access the game, to access the service, to play the game. That's all we're doing. We yeah. don't own our characters. No. We don't. They do. It's their it's their property. 
Sorry, Lou, but your trooper has the name that Moscow wanted for his trooper. You're out of the game. We deleted your account. And you know what that does? You know, that will happen. I mean, Mythic, okay, with Dark Age of Camelot back in the day, and same thing when Warhammer Online was a thing, was still around. Okay, they didn't play around. They actually, they would, they would just ban players left and right. You know, if you bought gold from a gold seller, guess what happened to your account? It was banned permanently. The moment, well, you tried to, the moment you tried to input it again to activate another account, say, hey, why is my account working? Oh, your account's banned. What else is around, sir? <laughs> well, the other thing is players, it can cause a big problem when there's a change as far as how the company operates because Bioware has been so lenient to up to this point. If they're going to start enforcing discipline, it needs to be a transition phase. They just can't come out and just start banning everybody because that would be horrible PR for them. And case in point, I mean, look what's happening with Sony Online Entertainment since they switched to Daybreak. Their community is up in arms because of the policies that are changing behind the scenes. And I don't think Bioware wants a situation like that. You know, Bioware is owned by EA. They want money. They don't want to alienate a huge portion of their player base. So if they're going to start disciplining people, I think that the only reason that they're starting to discipline people, I should say, is because a lot of their paying customers want to see people starting to get disciplined for these things now. And I think they've weighed, they've done the math. They're like, okay, well, if we don't start disciplining people, we're going to make this portion of paying customers upset. And if we do discipline people, this portion might get upset. Oh, well, the people that will be upset if we don't discipline is higher than the ones that will be if we do. And I think that's what it comes down to. They're they're measuring cost and potential cost and doing some math behind the scenes like that. But we're just going to have to watch it, see what direction this goes, and see what they do with future things that come up. I'm optimistic right now because they're actually starting to do something, which from my perception, it didn't seem like they did anything up until the Ravagers thing. So, you know, we'll just have to see how it goes. Hopefully some of these people that are being smug and bragging about how minor the punishment is start to really get nailed. All right, then, Paige, what's our Star Wars recommendation of the week this week? My Star Wars recommendation of the week is Lou's Surprise. Oh, my. This comes from Etsy.com from a seller called Nerdy Soap. And I included a picture for Lou's enjoyment. Uh, thank God I used Axe Body Wash. <laughs> Ew! <laughs> this looks like it's made out of Trick's Earwax. Alright, great fun Ewok Wicket Soap. <laughs> it's exactly what it sounds like. It is soap in the shape of Wicket the Ewok and when I first saw it I was like oh my god it's Treak and I was like Lou can just rub Treak all over his body just like I know he just wants like to just like he does every night <laughs> yes in my nightmares when the Emperor is torturing me that's not the Emperor <laughs> that's my probing device alright that's why I lock my door and I just want to include that it says plus a surprise soap with every order from our collection what else you gonna give me <laughs> you know what I don't want to know this we open the bag and it's Jar Jar with his tongue out uh, no uh, we're not doing that oh wasn't there body. a candy about that yeah, did they have a candy no before? no no with a built in tickle feature anyway for those interested in actually getting a look at the recommendation of the week I will be posting a link with the photo on the Facebook wall when this episode goes to iTunes Okay, Lou, any comment about rubbing Treak against your body? <laughs> yes, I'm about to flush myself out of the airlock. <laughs> don't bother, the toilets don't work. <laughs> Sit there. <we> <laughs> <laughs> Alright, Lou, so what do you got for the intelligence report tonight? We're continuing on with force power. Remember, folks, this one is a doozy since because, you know, it's but pretty much Foundation of Star Wars. The force powers. <laughs> So this week, we're going to pick it up with Force Sense. Or in a famous quote by Obi-Wan Kenobi, I felt a great disturbance in the Force, as if millions of voices suddenly cried out in terror, or were suddenly silenced. Don't worry, Ben, it'll be okay. It's only Alderaan. 
Force sense was among the most basic of force abilities. It could be used to feel another being's feelings, the future, ripples in the force caused by momentous or traumatic events, impending danger, and the presence of the dark side. A more concentrated, more directed form of this ability was likely how Jedi and Miralukas were able to see others without relying on their physical senses. The ability to heighten the senses of the force was usually one of the first things taught to a Jedi when they began their training. A Jedi student will learn how the Force binds all living things together and learns to recognize these bonds and how they interact. This enables them to feel their environment, detect danger, and the location of hidden beings or enemies even through barriers, as well as see in complete darkness. Jedi and other Force users would use this ability to sense impending danger, allowing the Force to warn them of a threat. This ability to sense danger would often come naturally to Force sensitives and allow the user to escape a potentially deadly situation as when Yoda thwarted the attempt on his life at the hands of his clone troopers and Kashyyyk. That was a great scene. This danger sense was often described as tingling feeling in the back of the mind that foretold danger. Though it was known only to warn a Jedi of danger and wouldn't provide any information as to where the danger would come from. The danger sense would usually flare up just before an attack or some other threat occurred, giving the Force user time to react to the danger. Jedi could sense the location of hidden beings or enemies from a distance and through barriers, allowing them to find, engage, or avoid a being. Advanced users of this ability, such as Jedi Master Kyle Katarn and his apprentice Jaden Kor, were even able to sense the health of a nearby being, Jedi Academy. When many beings died, Jedi would often feel their deaths through the Force, such as after the destruction of Alderaan by the Death Star. Jedi Master Obi-Wan Kenobi sensed a great disturbance in the Force. This was also seen during the initial execution of Order 66, when Grandmaster Yoda felt the deaths of thousands of Jedi across the galaxy. Great disturbances, such as planets being destroyed, were able to be sensed from anywhere in the galaxy. Jedi were also able to sense when a close friend or relative was in mortal danger, great pain, great distances, sometimes as much as from 10,000 light years away. Qui-Gon Jinn sensed the pending danger of his love, tall from a great distance and even saw some of her situation. This ability was closely related to the more advanced technique of Farsight, which usually came naturally as the Jedi's ability progressed. Luke Skywalker was known to have developed this ability while training with Yoda on Dagobah in three years after the Battle of Yavin, when he gained a brief glimpse of his friends in pain on Cloud City. An extension of Force Sense was the Jedi ability of telepathy. With this ability, Jedi could use the Force to sense a person's feelings, gain impressions or images of their thoughts, or even mentally communicate with other Jedi. Some Force users had the ability to conceal themselves from other Force users who might be trying to sense them with the Force. This ability was called Clear Mind. Some Jedi Sentinels had this ability, which would help them avoid detection in their covert missions to hunt down Darksiders. Precognition Precognition, also known as Danger Sense, was a universal Force power. The ability of foresight was perhaps universal to the Jedi or Force sensitives and was manifested in the form of Force visions of future events or helped the Jedi predict their opponent's movements. Okay, we have a couple examples here. Connor Jax was a noted person of this ability. Plo Koon's former master. Tivoka was known to have advanced precognition powers. Battle precognition was a variant of precognition that allowed one to sense the flows of the Force. Jedi Padawan, Talisbeth, and Wang Dung Isterhazi, better known as Scout, thankfully, had this power. The Jedi Knight Revan and Mitra Surik were known to be gifted users of battle precognition. Surik learned this ability from Brianna, last handmaiden. Darth Bane also possessed a natural ability for precognition before he even began training as a Sith. Nova Style possessed a nearly identical ability, which he called Blink. The Ichani were known to possess a variant of this ability, which did not draw from the Force, but from the warrior's own instincts. The most elite Ichani warriors were able to predict battles and even the course of a war. It was probable that such outcomes grew more likely or unlikely as critical moments approached and passed. Folks, if you're interested in seeing a demonstration of that, fire up if you have a copy of KOTOR 2. When your character interacts with the last handmaiden or Brianna, she'll actually tell you about that how, that, how that comes to be, how that works. Moving on to Shatterpoint. More on a quote from Mace Windu. I sometimes can see the weak places in an opponent. Shatterpoints. 
who being breakable can be broken. They can occur in individuals and in events. Shatter points were a complex force phenomenon, perceivable only by an unknown innate talent or immense focus and concentration on the part of the force user. Shatter points were akin to fault lines, similar to different pathways of actions. Adept force users were able to perceive these faults through the force and influence them. Shatter points were perceived like faults in a chorus with gem. In relation to events, a single strike or action could cause events to transpire completely differently than they might otherwise have. Often, shadow points existed for only brief moments, as they could be affected by even the smallest actions. Shadow points could also be discovered in the physiology of living beings. Cade Skywalker was able to perceive shadow points in Darth Talon and Nina Calixte, whom he had previously healed from mortal injury. By focusing through the force on where the healing had taken place, Skywalker was able to see where her old wounds were and reopen them. When applied to physical items, shatter points worked much in the same manner. An individual would view an item through the force, noting where it came together and also noting weak points in its composition. By allowing the force to surge through them into the weak point, individuals could effectively shatter the object, causing it to break into multiple fragments. Because the force granted supernatural ability to those who were adept in its use, materials thought to be near indestructible were easily destroyed. Such was the case with Jedi Knight Jaina Solo, who effortlessly shattered a disc of pure Mandalorian iron while practicing technique under her uncle Luke Skywalker. And yes, folks, that's actually a pretty, uh, pretty well written scene. Because as you know, if you've read the you know Mandalorian iron, that's what the armor Mandalorian's armor is made out of. Which, like, Frick and Kratos is pretty pretty much... It's not lightsaber proof, but it's highly lightsaber resistant. So in this case, when you see her actually demonstrate the ability to actually take that kind of armor or that, that metal is made up and just break it into little pieces like nothing, that's an amazing ability she manifested. Moving on to psychometry, or psychometry. Tomato, tomato. Psychometry, also known as postcognition, or telemetry, was a force power that was a mental technique of picking up impressions and traces of information about the object touched and the events that have surrounded it. This power allowed the user to view events as if they were there, including the sights, sounds, and feelings, both emotional and physical, that the will of the object experienced. This power was easier to use on a personal object that were used frequently. Objects that were used once or by several people often made the use of this power difficult, though it was still possible. This skill was useful for tracking, though it was not useful in open battle, and would fail to render useful information at times. The power could taint the user if the object had been used to execute dark side related actions, like murder. Use of the dark side enabled possessors of the power to use it on living beings, ripping memories from their brains. The Jedi Council strongly discouraged the use of <laughs> psychometry on dead bodies as the emotions prior to a violent death are so strong that the deceased would have likely brushed with the dark side. This endangered Jedi by exposing them to these powerful emotions. Additionally, at the time of the invasion of Naboo, the Jedi Council frowned upon excessive use of this power as it allowed the user to experience the intense emotions which might make them or her more susceptible to the dark side of the force. Extreme cases cause the psychometric mind to become trapped, and rarer still, cause death. And now, Force Empathy. Force Empathy was a force power related to Force Sense, but just involved picking up impressions of an individual's emotional state. And that's that. <laughs> Farsight. Farsight, also called Farsight or Farseeing, was the ability to gain vague impressions of events happening in other places or times using the Force. These visions focus on strong imagery and emotions. As we often hear, the future is always in motion, however, and is thus subject to change. Jedi and Sith skilled in this technique were capable of detecting when friends and apprentices were in danger, examining details of past events, and predicting the probable outcome of a stated course of action. Farsight could also be applied to combat, allowing the practitioner to glimpse moves his opponent may make as well as outside forces that might affect the battle. Sometimes, if the Jedi was in meditation for long enough, 
In Farsight, their spirit could leave their body for a limited amount of time, making their spirit able to go where they please. This was used for reconnaissance in a hostile place. Force Sight Or in a quote from Korea, When Run relies on sight to perceive the world, it is like trying to stare at the galaxy through a crack in the door. Force Sight Also known as Force Seeing or Combat Sense, was a basic Force ability, perhaps related to Force Sense. It enhanced the bearer's visual and spatial perception, even in the dark or behind walls. Seeing, quote unquote, with the Force was a useful skill, for as Obi Wan Kenobi said, Your eyes can deceive you, don't trust them. Thanks for the blast shield, man. Thanks. Training users could have their sight amplified and were able to counter Force persuasion and Force blinding powers. The Miraluka relied on this power constantly to compensate for their physical blindness. They could not perceive colors, but could distinguish organics, even dead, and their alignment from the surrounding environment by their char- characteristic aura. Most objects, including doors and walls, appear translucent, allowing to see through them. The Miraluka were the most skilled experts of this technique. Thanks to it, their reflexes were strengthened enormously. While this was a Miralukan attribute, it could be taught to other species. For instance, Lisa Smart taught Nature Surik, the exile, to use it. Korea also utilized the Miraluka version of Foresight to such an extent that her eyes atrophied due to disuse. Another known user was Ram Kota. He used it after his sight was lost in a duel with Galen Merrick, who also manages to gain this ability later on. This power was also used briefly by Darth Bane as a member of the Gloom Walkers unit until after being blinded by a flash canister. Hey, look at that. Jason Wilson was a special skill and ability as well. I wonder where we see her. Force Vision. Or in a quote from Master Yoda. Premonitions. Premonitions. Deep questions they are. Since the future, once all Jedi could, now few alone have the skill. Visions, gifts from the Force, and curses. Okay, this is from Yoda, not from me, so this is how I speak, folks. Uh, Force visions were rare, but powerful aspects of the Force, and considered the cornerstone of the unifying Force. Generally, when peering deep into the Force, a Force user had the potential to see events that could happen in the future. Force visions were extremely rare and uncontrollable. Often, one would meditate to gain a vision, but only a few would actually succeed. Anakin Skywalker and his descendants, particularly his son, Luke, and his grandsons, Jason Solo and Ben Skywalker, were often prone to Force visions. Master Yoda felt that visions were of great importance to the Force, and often acted on them as best he could. However, the Jedi warned that the future was always in motion, and that the events were only possible. As such, interpreting a vision by oneself was generally considered dangerous. Some Jedi and Sith skilled in this technique were capable of detecting when friends and apprentices were in danger, examining details of past events, and predicting the probable outcome of a stated course of action. The Sith were also very vision prone, but unlike the Jedi, they believed, either through experience or just because they wanted to believe it, that visions would always come to pass and that they must work to make it so. <laughs> Some Sith would even input their own ideas of what might come to be into their visions. Darth Sidious was perhaps the most vision-prone Dark Lord of the Sith in history, and used it to ensure his own election as Supreme Chancellor and his ascension as Galactic Emperor. Emperor Palpatine also consulted on his visions with the Prophets of the Dark Side, a Sith splinter group that was dedicated to studying the future through the Dark Side of the Force. Some Sith such as Darth Traya or Kriya, could even peer into the future many thousands of years and predict events with great accuracy. This way, she could foretell the death of the last of the Mandalorians at the hands of a Jedi. Force vision had its limitations. Palpatine, in his visions of the future, never saw himself die. Darth Cadus also saw many possibilities of the future, yet none of them involved his death. That's Jason Solo, folks. It is unknown why this limitation occurred. However, Darth Tenebris was able to calculate the future and foresee his own death, showing that this limitation could be overcome if one possessed prodigious skill in that area. And just as a final note, Force Visions could be a form of precognition, or considered as such, 
And this concludes part four of Force Powers. Next week, we're going to pick it up again, and this time we're going to start with telepathy. And as always, I wish to say a big thank you to Wikipedia, StarWars.com, TheForce.net, and the other great Star Wars lore sites that are out there. Folks, if you enjoy the Star Wars lore, the universe as much as I do, please visit these sites. Look up your topics. Read them and enjoy them. I love how it cautions that with Force Vision, it's only something that's possible to happen and it's not necessarily something that's guaranteed to happen. <laughs> and when you talked about the Jedi Covenant, they actually unintentionally caused somebody to wipe them out because they were acting on a vision that they thought was going to come to pass. Mm-hmm. And then when you're watching the Star Wars prequels, Anakin basically kills Padme because he acts on a vision that didn't have to come to pass. Right. And, you know, one of the uh, other telling things as well is, let me scroll back up here. All right, with Kriya, you know, being able to tell when the Mandalorians would finally, you know, be wiping the face of the galaxy. Okay. Ironic, though, that, you know, <laughs> the clone troopers in the end will help wipe out the Jedi, but in the end, you know, there are no Mandalorians in the galaxy, per se. What about uh, Boba Fett? Uh, let's see. He is going to die eventually. <laughs> but I thought that the Sarlacc path spits him back out. Yep, it did. Because apparently, you know, his armor is tougher and he's tougher than he looks. Oh, which wait, is cool. that's non canon. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's EU. So, yeah, we have to remember that now. Yeah, Boba but... Fett's dead. <laughs> Well, he, he, he rolled to the Starlock pit, man. He got the achievement, worm food. <laughs> oh, <laughs> At least he got gosh. That. <laughs> Boba Fett, comma, worm food. Worm food. Hey, I make it a point now on all my characters when I hit Tatooine. That's one of the uh, first things I do when I hit that, that part of the, of the map. And let's, the <laughs> let's roll right into that Sarlacc pit that, for some reason, is an exhaustion zone and doesn't actually eat us. And go right ahead into the next Sarlacc pit that we call the Community Hollow Feed. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, folks. This is where we go over your emails, tweets, and Facebook feedback. The first thing up, trivia question of the week. Each week, we're going to post a trivia question into our YouTube version of the show. Simply go to StarWarsBeyond.com, and we'll link you right to the episode. On the episode page, there will be a button you press to see the trivia question of the week. Yeah, uh, the way it's set up, folks, you see the little, little gray bars. We can skip to certain parts of the show. Last one's usually it. <laughs> Alternatively, it'll always be after we say our goodbyes. Then shoot us an email with the answer to starsbeyond at gmail.com. And in your email, please include character name, your faction, server, and your action. What about faction? Yes, along with the character name. <laughs> It, it, precisely, please, because sometimes if I, by the off chance, I misspell it or there's a hyphen or whatever, fancy, please, especially if you have the fancy symbols, if you use an international keyboard layout, please let me know. Because I don't, I have mine set up for the U.S. I have a UK keyboard. So, what's so the pound sign instead of the dollar sign? That's cool. It, it has both. <laughs> the pound sign is on the number three and the dollar sign is on the number four. That's the same. Well, no, because when I say pound, I'm not talking about like the hashtag. I'm talking about the British. Oh, more would be so proud of you. <laughs> but we digress. If there is more than one correct answer, we'll do a random drawing to win a cartel pack. Meaning, Fred should be the focus of all your hate mail because I usually, you know, say pick a number, Fred, <laughs> and he's the one who gets to choose the number. Ah. <laughs> uh. Send all hate mail to Fred at Southwell Corp. <coughs> Everyone, to be fair, this keyboard is because of Mad Mar. <laughs> Go ahead. Everyone that answers correctly will be entered into a drawing for a much larger prize, which we'll draw on the show every few months. You can be entered into the grand prize drawing every time you answer correctly. So if you didn't win the cartel pack that week, folks, remember, as long as you answer correctly, Fred enters your name into the grand prize pool. All right, and we just had one a couple weeks ago. That's right, and the next person is going to win some Ewoks, so... <laughs> Not just that, but you know, our 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 first winner. You know, what did he order again? I forgot he to tell. asked for the large Beyond the Stars mug. Did he ever get that, Fred? Yes, that was delivered a long time ago. At this point. Oh, what was that? It was like a 
like a regular eight ounce mug or twelve. I forgot the dimensions of the cup. Oh, I think it's bigger than that. I thought it was sixteen. Oof. Twenty ounce cup of coffee. Holy oh. crap. What is it, a seven eleven mug? <laughs> <laughs> oh come on, you know Dunkin' Donuts sells those huge cups that use those reusable cups. Those things are it's amazing. Terrible. You got me looking now to see the specs on this cup. Hey, you said large. We had there's some of the different sizes there. It is yes, yeah, twenty ounces. Oof. Yikes. I hope he fills that thing up with coffee. <laughs> and Several times a day. While he just like me. To the show. There we go. Yeah. The, I can't yeah. sleep now. <laughs> I'm having too much coffee during the day. And you know, you can get this available as a color changing mug as well. So like oh if God. you hold that handle like anywhere your hand touches and warms it, it turns black. You can be like, look, I'm using the force. Ooh. And that doesn't cost any extra either. Wait, can we get a two-tone one where, you know, when the cup the cup is cool, it's the the Alliance Phoenix symbol, and then when it's hot, it's the actual Imperial symbol. That would be awesome. I'm getting a little bit crazy now, Lou. Okay, okay. Uh, I'm just just talking it out there. Blue sky, blue sky. <laughs> just putting it out there. But yeah, basically, what we did for our winner here, we just threw out there he could have anything on this store that he wanted and that's what he picked and i see a beyond the stars acrylic double wall tumbler that i'm going to be getting for drinking smoothies in the morning oh my god i want one too Ooh, smoothies oh with without alcohol sorry should i specify that <laughs> <laughs> all right who was last week's winner oh hey just segue out of that no fun <laughs> Last week's winner for the trivia question is Lou G. <sighs> hey, from our home, well, my home server, Jedi Covenant. Congratulations, sir. He guessed correctly. And if you're wondering what the answer is, I don't remember. Oh, yeah, I do. <laughs> the answer I would is. I love if you did that one week. I don't remember. <laughs> it's not important. All right, the answer to. <laughs> <laughs> the, trivia, the trivia show where the questions are made up and the answers don't matter. The answer was the Gree. Okay, they were, or they are, one of the oldest civilizations in the Star Wars universe. Okay, uh, supposedly a little bit older than the Rakata, but, you know, that's debatable since obviously the Gree, if you read up on them, they don't even remember their own history. They've been around for so long. <laughs> okay. And when you see them in Swotor, they were at that point in the civilization to where they really don't innovate anymore, okay? All they can do is continue building at the level of technology they've attained, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50,000 years ago when they reached the peak of their existence or of their technological development, okay? Um, when you read further into that, they have become so focused on maintaining their level of technology is that they've forgotten how to innovate now. So they, they no longer have any more original ideas. All they can do is expand on what they've built, even though when you look at it, in the end, the stuff they've built, or, or for them, is just so old and outdated and archaic, is still thousands of light years ahead of what even the current Star Wars universe has. Like when you hit New Hope, the degree technology technically is is like you know us like computers and someone in the 1200s using you know good old fashioned paper and a quill pen and taking time to write and copy <laughs> by candlelight all right that's how that's how the star wars ip you know is portraying the level of technology that we have over everyone else in the universe to be fair luke is kind of hovering around on a raft <laughs> I mean, it don't take much to be more technologically advanced. Like, if somebody had a car, they would have had trumped him. Maybe. Even a really fast lawnmower. <laughs> are you are you knocking his, his T-16 back home? That he bullseyes Womp Rats with? <laughs> I thought the T-16 was a gun. Nope. It's a Skyhopper. He bullseyes womp rats with that thing. They're they're too stupid to move. No, they're not much bigger than two meters. 
I'm sad now. Uh, yeah, you should be. Somebody else guessed this right. <laughs> yes, Mike T, a.k.a. to Chuck. So, Mike T, even though you didn't win this week, you do, again, get to enter into the grand prize. Drawing. Congrats, Maybe you'll be you're a loser week. this week. <laughs> wow, you sound like a, 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 one of those old t-shirt couples from the 90s. Like Pat Sajak. <laughs> you sound like... You want to spin again? <laughs> oh my! And your Swotor community, check out our fellow Swotor <laughs> podcasts. Most of them are available on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, and at SwotorNetwork.com. Torocast is at Torocast.com. Corellian Run Radio at CorellianRun.com. UntiniCast at UntiniCast.com. Swotor Skate Podcast at NewOverlords.com. The Usual Podcast at TheUsualPodcast.com. Old Republic Radio is on iTunes, as well as Healing Swotor and Enmity Podcast. And finally, the Bad Feeling Podcast is at BadFeelingPodcast.com. Be warned, that is an explicit podcast. Also, follow Madmar at Swotor Family for the latest happenings in the Swotor community. If you'd like to have your podcast listed on this segment, send us an email at StarWarsBeyond at gmail.com. All right, Pedro already told you our email address. You can like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Star Wars Beyond Podcast. And you can visit our site at StarWarsBeyond.com. You can tweet us at Star Wars Beyond. You can tweet me at Sith Lord Corv. You can tweet Lou at GamerGuy11B. And you can tweet Paige at Ace of Fiery. And now it's time for our final thoughts. My final thoughts. It seems like I was the... <laughs> Never mind, I can't do that. <laughs> Go ahead, Lou. <laughs> <laughs> My final thought. Well, I'm glad that they, you know, you know, they admitted they pushed back the maintenance until later on this week, which is good. Maybe get some last minute fixes in there. A uh, whole lot of changes coming through. I'm glad they're doing that. So, again, folks, be on the lookout for what they're doing. And, again, I'm glad that Bioware is taking the steps that they need to to police up the community, all right, to make the game the game and environment overall a much better place for all of us to be in <clears throat> right, to play in because if we're unhappy not with the game itself but just where the community is you know that is a motivating factor to drive people away from the game too your game can be great but if your players are, are jerks or d-backs one another you know what happens in the end no one plays the game <laughs> so I'm glad they're taking these steps they're moving forward and they're coming up with a system that will work for them and be fair to the players as well. So let's support them and help them out any way we can with that. Boo. Oh, I mean, I put Ewok soap in Lou's coffee. Beyond the Stars is an independently recorded fan podcast made in association with NSG Productions. And now it's time to say goodnight. ID10T set a course for Balmora. Good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you all for joining us. See you all again next time, and I'm about to slice this droid. And now who knows where the hell we're going to end up. Good night, everybody. Served your purpose. Beyond the Stars trivia question for the week of March 11th, 2015. First clue. As a young child, I saw my parents killed during a planetary war and it drove me to join the military. Second clue. Evolving into a ruthless, cold blooded killer, I left the military a decorated war veteran and declined imperial service. Third clue. As a mercenary, I went from conflict to conflict, improving and honing all my skills to the finest, from hand to hand to piloting. Fourth clue. In time, I was the deadliest gunslinger in the galaxy, where even the Assassin's Guild would renege on their contracts on me. Fifth clue. 
I would meet my end while pursuing vengeance against a young smuggler and his crew when they pursued a legendary pirate treasure. Who am I? And as always, folks, please send your responses to starsbeyond at gmail.com. Please include your character name, faction, and the server you play on. And as always, good luck. Looking forward to seeing your answers.